This week in lab, we are doing the Friedel Crafts alkylation of metazoline or 1,3-dimethylbenzene. <clears throat> Let's take a look at the mechanism. We're going to be taking and reacting 2-chloro-2-methylpropane uh, with a Lewis acid catalyst. Let's look at the mechanism on how, what happens here. First step of the mechanism is this aluminum only has six electrons around it. There is a huge partial positive charge on it. And the six it's got, the three chlorines are pulling them away. So this is a Lewis acid. It's acting as a catalyst. We should get it back at the end. The chlorine from our, from our alkyl halide is going to donate to the aluminum. Get your charges. Initial tail becomes more positive by charge, so that chlorine has a full positive charge. Final head becomes more negative by charge, the aluminum has a full negative charge. Now that chlorine being an electronegative atom does not like having the plus charge, so this is going to break apart. We could break it apart on the side we just formed, so it could go back. But if we, we can also break it apart on the other side here. We'll break this carbon-chlorine bond. Take those electrons onto the chlorine. That will get rid of the plus charge on the chlorine. Chlorine is now neutral, and we have made a carbyl cation. That carbyl cation is our electrophile. That's what's going to react with our metazyl. So let's take a look at that. Now we have to decide where it's going to go. The groups that are already on the ring directs the next one where to go. These are ortho paradirectors, methyl groups are. So let's take a look at the two. Let's look at the top one here. This is ortho to it. Here is para to it. If you look at the other, let me just underline that one. That's the, this one. If we look at, one, at the other methyl, this is ortho to it. And this is the para to that methyl. Now, this is where the groups are telling it to go. However, this is a very large electrophile that we are bringing in. Especially if you draw out all the, if you were to draw out all the hydrogens on it, that is a big old group. If I were to draw all these hydrogens out, that's a very large group question is, is it can it fit in next to the methyl? It wants to go in these positions that we've highlighted here, but can it fit in there? That's a large group. We're going to have steric interactions. Now there's no way it's going to fit in between the two methyls. There's just no way we can fit that in here. question is, is can it fit in just next to one methyl? No way it can fit in next to two methyls not going to go there. Actually with this, this is large enough that it's not going to be able to fit in these positions. Even though these methyls are trying to direct it, ortho and para, because of its size and the steric interactions, it's actually going to go into the meta position. This is meta to both of those methyl groups. It's going to go into that meta position just simply because of the sterics. So we're going to take a pair of electrons out of the double bond. Those are going to come and add to the carbocation. Now we went from an aromatic ring to a non-aromatic, that's an arenium cation. It's not too bad, it does have resonance, but we still want to get the aromatic ring back. We also need to get our catalyst back, otherwise it's not a catalyst if you don't get it back at the end. So we need to pull off the hydrogen off of the carbon where we just put the electrophile. 
So our, we need our catalyst back. We're going to take chlorine off of this. It's going to come and grab that hydrogen. The electrons kick toward the plus charge to reform that double bond, reform our aromatic ring. And that gives us our product that we're making this week. We get our catalyst back and the chlorine grabbed the hydrogen. We're also making HCl. HCl is a gas. Now we often add it, use HCl in the lab, hydrochloric acid, but it's dissolved into water. Uh, it's what we, when you see the liquid version, it's the gas is dissolved into water but HCl itself is a gas. So we're gonna have HCl gas coming off. Okay, so this is our product this week. Now, at the end of the lab, we are gonna take an IR spectra of the product. The IR is gonna let us know about the substitution pattern. We're going to look down into the fingerprint region uh, to look for the substitution pattern on aromatic rings. We have, with aromatic rings, with our benzene rings, we have an out-of-plane bending. This, this out-of-plane bending just put it on here. It's the CHs here on the benzene ring. We're looking at that out of plane bending off of those. Now, the region for your out of plane bending is down about uh, 650 up to about 870 or so uh, reciprocal centimeters. There is a chart in your procedure, on the second page of your procedure, there is a chart that lists the substitution patterns. So we're looking for one or two peaks down in this region, and that's going to tell us the substitution of benzene rings. This out of plane bending, it's also sometimes referred to, they abbreviate, you may see OOP, O O P, OOP. Uh, that's our out of plane bending. So we're supposed to be our product this week is a 135 substituted, tri substituted benzene. So if you look at your chart, our 135 tri substituted should have a peak between 810 and 865 reciprocal centimeters, and then there's a second uh, bending that we see, second peak somewhere between 675 and 730 reciprocal centimeters. That will show us that we have the 135 tri-substituted. If it's any other substitution pattern, say our group went on to maybe this position, that would be a 125. One, two, four, sorry, 124. I said one, two, five, one, two, four, try substituted. Then you can see where you're supposed to have the peaks. It's a totally different position. So we can tell the difference in our substitution on these aromatic rings by looking at this out of plane bending. Your starting material, or starting material was the metaxylene, one, three, dot substituted. And you can see the numbers on, in your chart for the starting material. I will give you an IR spectra of the starting material so you'll have that to compare with. You may, when you take an IR of your product, you may still see some starting material in there. We can, we can see that on the spectra. It will show up. Uh, look for those peaks to see if you have any starting material still present. You should have product, but there also may be a little bit of starting material if you didn't do a good job purifying. Now, with our lab this week, we need to be extremely careful with the catalyst. 
water will destroy that catalyst. Aluminum chloride is a Lewis acid. Water can serve as a Lewis base. So we get an acid base reaction. We have we have added the oxygen to the aluminum. This can break apart. We lose a hydrogen off of the oxygen and lose a chlorine. This will then become neutral and we have made HCl. This can further react, this can keep reacting with more water go again with another water molecule and eventually we make aluminum hydroxide. So we can keep reacting as long as there's chlorines on there. And so we wind up losing our Lewis acid catalyst. So we do need to avoid any water in the reaction. Let's take a look at our procedure. Uh, it's pretty straightforward, so you're going to take the metaxylene, add in uh, the T-butyl chloride, which is also called 2-chloro-2-methylpropane. That's the same thing, 2-chloro-2-methylpropane's IUPAC, T-butyl chloride's a common name. That's the same compound. You're going to add that in a dry reaction tube, and I have reaction tubes in the oven that are dry, so we'll put a, uh, uh, come back to the oven, we'll get you a reaction tube, a dry one, put a septum on there. <clears throat> now, when we set this up, our setup for this reaction, remember we get HCl as a byproduct in the reaction and we're going to make a trap to take care of that HCl gas. So we have our reaction tube with our reactants in here. You have a septum on the top. We're going to have a polyethylene tubing. That tubing is in your kit. This tubing is going to go into an inverted reaction tube that contains a piece of wet cotton. Now the wet cotton, the cotton has nothing to do with anything but the water does. So HCl gas is going to be given off. It's going to come up through the tubing into, into this reaction tube that has the wet cotton. So our HCl comes in contact with that water. This is going to make hydronium and a chlorine anion. Now, this was a gas, this is a liquid. And so now we don't have to worry about breathing HCl gas. So we have this trap to take care of the gas. Now our reaction tube, we're going to cool this in an ice bath because this is a very exothermic reaction. It'll tend to get out of control, so we'll have an ice bath here. Now you'll have uh, your metaxylene, your T-butyl chloride in there, get all of this set up, and then coming when we're ready for the add the catalyst come and grab me and I will help you with the adding the catalyst we're going to add approximately 30 milligrams does not doesn't have to be exact and we'll open this up temporarily put the catalyst in close it back really quick and so I will help you with that we'll work together on that uh, so we can be as fast as possible and it's not having to be exposed to the air any longer than need be because again, water that's in the air will destroy our catalyst. 
Now, once we get the catalyst in, this going, you're going to start to see it bubble and boil. Uh, you'll see bubbles coming up. It's not boiling. It's bubbles coming off because that's the HCl gas that's being given off. That's the bubbles that you see is the HCl gas that's being given off. And in the beginning, it will bubble like crazy. Uh, over time, it will start to slow down. And so once the majority of the bubbling has stopped, we're not getting any more HCl gas coming off, uh, it takes approximately 15 minutes, uh, 15 to 20 minutes after we've added the catalyst, it should start to slow down. Uh, take that out, let it warm up to room temperature, and then it will finish. That'll take another 15 or 20 minutes to warm up. Uh, it'll start bubbling again, so get it out of the ice. That's just to finish the reaction. We had the ice here in the beginning to keep it under control in the beginning. And once the bubbling slows down, then you can take it out of the ice, let it warm to room temperature to finish reacting. We are then going to add, once, once the bu bubbling has essentially stopped, it will never stop. You'll see some little tiny bubbles for hours. but. The, the main bubbling will have ceased. Once the bubbling has pretty well come to a stop, we're gonna add one mil of water. Now, what's the purpose of adding water? We went through all this before trying to avoid water. Why are we adding water now? Well, the reaction's done, and I want rid of the catalyst now. So we are purposely adding water in there to destroy the catalyst, to get rid of it. We add water in, that aluminum chloride reacts with the water, makes aluminum hydroxide. Aluminum, aluminum hydroxide is water soluble. So that will now go into the water layer and we can remove the catalyst. We've destroyed it and removing it at the same time there. You'll mix that well, allow the layers to separate, and then you'll separate your layers. You have your organic layer and your water layer. We'll get rid of that water layer, which is getting rid of our catalyst. We're then going to add in uh, one mil of saturated aqueous sodium bicarbonate. And what's the purpose of that? Sodium bicarbonate is a weak base. Remember, we've got HCl that's coming off, so there could still be some acid that's dissolved in our solution. So we're adding the sodium bicarbonate to neutralize any acid that's in there that still remains. So that's the purpose of adding the saturated sodium bicarbonate. Uh, you'll mix that, allow the layers to separate, and then remove the aqueous layer. Now next, you're going to add in one mil of saturated sodium chloride. Now we've used the sodium chloride before. That's to pre-dry the solution. Now we had what we purposely added water there earlier, so there could be water in our solution. So the sodium chloride pre-dries. That saturated salt solution will pre-dry it. You allow the layer, mix it, allow the layers to separate, remove the aqueous layer, and then we're going to finish drying it over calcium chloride pellets. So we'll add calcium chloride pellets in to finish drying it. Again, sodium chloride pre-dries, get rid of, rid of most of the water, but then the calcium chloride will finish drying it. Uh, you're going to transfer this to a clean reaction tube, add a boiling chip, and then heat up to boiling. Um, so at this point, we don't have the ice. We don't have all this on top. You're going to transfer your solution now to a clean reaction tube. Put a boiling chip in the bottom. There's my boiling chip. We're going to heat that up to boiling on the sandbox. And we're going to put a pasture pipette. So this needs to be outside of the hood. You've got to be able to reach an aspirator. So you're going to put a pipette in. And this is hooked up to the aspirator. We're going to heat this up to boiling. And so you'll have vapors coming up. It'll be boiling the vapors coming up. And we're trying to suck the vapors. You don't want to suck any liquid. So that pipette should be about three centimeters above the liquid. So just a little over an inch, if you want to think of it that way. Uh, so about three centimeters above the liquid should be sufficient. So this is helping us get rid of the vapors. Now we're heating this up to boiling. 
the metaxylene has a much lower boiling point than the product does, so any unreacted metaxylene should get boiled away and removed with the aspirator. So we're boiling away, distilling out any unreacted metaxylene. You want to distill this till about half of the liquid is gone. So look and see how much you had to start with. Let's say we had, I don't know, let's say we had one milliliter. You want to distill down till there's only like a half a milliliter left. We want to distill off half of the liquid. However much you had, just note how much you had to begin with and distill off half of it. We're not doing a percent yield this week, so don't worry about, you don't have to worry about a yield. We're not doing a percent yield this week. Distill off half of it, get at least half so that we make certain we've gotten rid of all of the metaxylene, any unreacted metaxylene, and you should have nice pure product left in the tube. You'll take an IR spectra and then compare that with the starting material. So you're looking down at that out of plane bending region to see the substitution pattern. And so you'll compare those values to the chart and see what the substitution pattern is. You can also see if there's any unreacted metaxylene still in your reaction tube as well. That will show up as well. Uh, we are not going to do uh, NMR like we did last week, but uh, I will give you an NMR spectra of the product, and you can discuss that in your uh, write-up. So. Um, this is a pretty lengthy lab, so I'm not going to do, we're not going to do NMR at the end, but I will give you an NMR spectra of the product, and so you can discuss that. How does that spectra prove that we made the product that we say we did? Okay, so that's the lab this week.